So here we go. So hi everyone, um, welcome to this webinar today. We are beyond excited to be talking with Jess Rufus, the founder of Collaborasaurus. Um, we, we think what Jess is doing with her um, online platform to help brands collaborate together is amazing. Um, and we can actually speak from first-hand experience because we have um, been able to collaborate with quite a few brands. Thank you to Jess. Um, so we really um, love everything that Jess is doing and wanted to share um, her insights into building great business collaborations um, with you because we've definitely seen the benefits for our business um, this year in doing all sorts of different collaborations, which I think we might get to a little bit later in a couple of examples. Um, but Jess, also, I featured you on the Leap Stories a couple of months ago because um, you did. Yeah, yeah, you've done an incredible thing <laughs> launching um, this amazing platform based on your experience in the PR world. Um, um, so we we would like you to just maybe give us um, a little bit of background as to what it is that you um, have created and how you came to do it um, and why collaborations are so important. Um, well, that's a big question. Well, um, Collaborasaurus is really like, I mean, there's a bunch of questions in that one, but Collaborasaurus essentially it works like a dating site. So if you know of Tinder or eHarmony or RSVP, it works like that, but for brands to find really good opportunities for marketing exposure. So if you think about collaborations, it's really about two brands exchanging assets. So every brand has something that another brand would love to get, whether that's social media, following or just an engaged community or email list or excess product, that kind of stuff as well. So collaborations are really an opportunity to come together with another brand, whether it's an ongoing relationship or a one-off relationship, which often ha happens with events, um, as a way to really grow your business in a cost-effective uh, way. So the reason that Collaborasaurus was built and that idea came about was because of my own frustrations with sourcing and negotiating mutually beneficial, relevant partnerships with other brands and a lot of the time that came down to um, media events and stuff for fashion brands that we were representing who wanted, you know, a caterer but on very little money. So what we'd end up doing was we'd, you know, find another brand that had the catering capabilities and then work out a bit of a sort of barter deal, I guess. So that's really what a strategic partnership is, is like two brands recognizing that they have assets that can help each other. So they come together, create something amazing and help each other grow. So um, Collaborasaurus came about to make the whole thing a lot easier and less time consuming um, by building it into a matchmaking platform. So it's anonymous and um, brands can hop in there, fill in details about their business and industry and target market and how they're looking to grow, which we'll get into a little bit later. And then they'll be matched with other brands who can help them do that essentially so you can come together and create cool stuff. Fantastic. So I love this yeah, story. So that's that in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. Um, and like so many um, things that we cover off is that in solving your own problem, you've actually created a solution for um, for, for all of us. So thank you yes. <laughs> for doing that. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> um, so we should just start um, and jump in um, with the with the presentation that we have. So Bin, do you want to? So what we like to do with our webinars is give you as quick a snapshot as we can over your lunch time to, um, I guess, Jess's top 10 tips for successful strategic partnerships and, and how to go about setting up your own collaboration. So we're going to hand over to Jess to answer some of the questions that we've found come up a lot with the kin that we work with throughout our workshops and workshops uh, but, work and e-courses. But, um, but we will have a time for a Q&A at the end. So if you do end up having any of your own questions, make a note of them and um, you can come over to the question section at the end and we'll be able to try and answer them the best that we collectively can. Absolutely. So let's start with... Um, Jess explaining to us what exactly is a strategic partnership and it, obviously they can take very different forms depending on your business type. So if Jess could explain a little bit about the different forms that they they can present themselves. Yeah, so I mean collaborations can, strategic partnerships can be used in so many different ways. Um, really what Collaborasaurus has done, we've um, sort of whittled it down to four major types that um, most collaborations seem to fit into and they come down to event collaborations, social media collaborations, product creation and referral marketing. 
as well. So, but then Calabasaurus also has a fifth option, which is open to possibilities as well. If you're not 100% sure what type your business fits into, which we'll go into in a second. But a strategic partnership is really just two brands um, recognizing that they have particular assets that can help each other, and then so they come together and um, they get this mutually beneficial arrangement that's strategic. So Calabasaurus, um, the way we look at strategic partnerships is really from a marketing perspective. So we use them as a way to grow our business and get in, get exposure in front of our ideal audience and target market. So event collaborations, we're going to go through a couple of um, examples in a second, but it's things like you know a venue and a company coming together and collaborating on that rather than just paying for a venue outright. Social media collaborations can just be cross promotions or competitions or that kind of thing as well. Um, product creation are sometimes like coolest ones that I've seen just because it's a physical thing. And I know that um, Vinny and Kylie have put together some really cool ones in a little ebook for you guys. But um, the product collaborations are when two brands co brand and um, co promote a product together. Um, and then there's the referral marketing. Um, collaboration as well, which is really the old school marketing form that almost has the um, best return out of every marketing strategy I've ever seen. And that's really um, you know, a marketer recommending a web designer or a nutritionist recommending a personal trainer, that kind of thing. So it's like complementary businesses referring each other clients essentially. Mm, fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> So I guess the thing so, that a lot of questions ask, <laughs> a lot of businesses ask themselves is, well, why would you collaborate? What's what's in it for me, and or what's in it for the other person? Why would they, you know, want to join forces with me? Yeah, look, I think um, the why really comes down. I mean, every collaboration is really different um, depending on the business and the goals and the target market and all that kind of stuff. But that's why they're so valuable because they're so different. But really, the main reasons. Um, why a business would collaborate is to tap into engaged communities that already exist who would already love your product. So if you think about, or, or service, so if you think about, so for example, Collabasaurus with me, um, we're collaborating right now on this webinar. So I'm tapping into an audience that is already complimentary, it would already be interested in you know, what I'm doing and collaboration, all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, we're not in competition with each other, like myself and Ofkin, that kind of stuff. So the reason to collaborate is to tap into audiences that already exist, that would already love your product. Um, another reason is to make money. So particularly if you are um, co-branding and um, co-promoting a product in collaboration, often you'd split the profit for that. Essentially, you're doubling your audience in your marketing um, then with a product that could have heaps of opportunity there. Um, and then there's also brand alignment as well. So it's a really great way to align yourself with brands that are going to help you grow and help you help boost your business in the in the long run as well. Wonderful. Well, they sound like um, all pretty good reasons to me. <laughs> good reasons? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and ones that we've, at, we've definitely seen um, in our business. So, mm. yeah. And, you know, that goes both ways. Um, Jess, what you were saying in terms of you collaborating with us on this, but you've also helped us mm. with event collaborations that exposed our yeah. to other um, to other audiences as well. So yeah, yeah. And we will touch on that a little bit later yeah. in a bit more detail. Yeah, yeah. So, the best, I mean, the best way that I've seen people use collaborations is really to tap into existing communities and audiences that are really relevant to them. So it's if you think about any marketing campaign you run, whether it's Facebook ads that you're setting up, you're, it's a little bit blind as to who exactly you're getting in front of. Um, you know, you can target it as much as you possibly can, but there is a little bit of risk there. You're just putting, you know, an ad out into the world. And the same thing with, you know, PR or a magazine advert or something. You can spend a lot of money on those kind of ad campaigns and not be hitting an audience who would end up buying from you. So Brand collaborations, if they're done right and they're thought out and they're very strategic, then you can actually get in front of a very engaged, um, big audience all at once and no, with with no money at all sometimes, yeah, um, and get an incredible results. So yeah, they're great. <laughs> I, think, I think the other aspect too you mentioned before, you know, it's the dollars and and the exposure to a broader audience. But yeah. if you're a really new business and you're trying to cement mm -hmm. what your brand stands for and your values, is a collaboration could be just helping people understand what you stand for by collaborating with brands that stand for similar things. So it's actually more of a community. Yeah, absolutely. 
yeah positioning yeah absolutely and I mean there's no there's no limitation on the size of your business as to you know when or how you can collaborate I mean a lot of the startups and small businesses that are on Collabasaurus and who I work with privately I mean we've seen a collaboration happen between Topshop and a little Melbourne patisserie which was incredible they got social media exposure to over 300,000 people and the little Melbourne patisserie it was unbelievable but there's also all of these little small collaborations you can do all this all the time so there's you know a small business and another small business who have complementary markets and communities it's like well why not you could do something cool together yeah and that kind of thing cool yeah well that brings us beautifully into the number three of our top 10 is what's the right collaboration for my business if you could sort of um help us in how to assess uh, and, and our mm. pin is what's going to work best for them. Yeah. I think the the two things to think about when you're deciding what, what type of um, collaboration to go for is really, firstly, who is your target market? So who do you want to get in front of? How old are they? What's their gender? Where else are they hanging out? What kind of interests do they have um, outside of your product and business? Um, and then have a look at your goals. So Lots of people just say to me when I say, oh, you know, how do you want to grow, grow your business or what, what are your goals for next year? They'll just say, oh, to sell more products or to grow. And it's just like, well, yes, that's, that's a really good goal, but there needs to be so many little, little steps in between. So if you think about, okay, you want to focus on social media growth, for example. You want to focus on growing your email list or you want to focus on pushing one particular product and get it in front of the right people, that kind of thing. So really pin down exactly how you want to grow, like where you want to grow. A lot of the people on Club at the moment, just because it's such a buzz topic, is Instagram. Everyone wants to grow their Instagram right now because they can see the engagement is so high. So if that's the thing you want to focus on, choose a collaboration type that can allow you to do that, if that makes sense. And, so and I think what you're just an Instagram growth. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think what you're tapping into there is get clear about what your metric for success is. So, you know, is it also growing your Instagram by 50 new followers by doing this? Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I mean, there's always a little bit of sort of testing and measuring. Every collaboration is going to be different, like I said. But if you're really, you know, focusing on Instagram growth, then you'd look at the types like the social media collaboration. Yeah. Or you would look at maybe an event collaboration with the goal of growing your Instagram. So you make sure that, you know, the hashtag and the um, Instagram handles and stuff are everywhere at the event and all that kind of stuff and there's lots of engagement going on. So know your know how you want to grow first and then work your collaboration type out from there. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, so the next one is where do you start if you want to collaborate? Yes. Mm -hmm. Did you want to say something on that, guys? No, well, it was more, you know, you can get really excited about it. No, yeah, 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 this year or, or 2016 is going to be my year of collaboration. And then it's like, oh, God, what do I do now? Where do I start? <laughs> uh, well, of course, I'm going to say start on Collabasaurus. <laughs> um, it's a free platform, so we've made it um, quite easy to get get on there and get started and we prompt all the things you need to prepare so it will ask you from drop down menus and little check boxes and stuff who your target market is so it kind of forces you to get quite specific about stuff um, and it also because it's all prompted it makes it a little bit clearer and easier to um, navigate your assets you're offering and who you want to get in front of and how you want to grow so but if you wanted to start with the sort of step before Collabasaurus is to really understand who you want to get in front of how you want to grow and also what your assets are, which is probably the one thing that I see most businesses get stuck on. They either think that they have nothing to offer, which is never the case ever, but it's just sort of hard to get your head around <laughs> what your assets are exactly. That you don't have anything to offer. <laughs> Well, in a collaboration. So I think a lot of businesses go, yes, you know, I've got a great business, but then who would want to collaborate with me and why? So you've got to figure out how you can frame that in a way that another business will go, yes, you know, I really want to work with you. Um, so I think if you, you know, not everyone has a huge social media following or budget to spend or a huge email list, and that's absolutely fine. So I think with your asset, you've got to kind of think outside the box a little bit. Um, and often I say, okay, well, what are your skills then? So think about if you have photography skills or if you have design skills. A lot of graphic designers on Collabasaurus at the moment and their skills are their asset. So, and then there's also excess product, you know, 
know if you're creating a product, if you have a couple of um, pieces of products you can spare in exchange for awesome marketing exposure, then it can be a mutually beneficial partnership. So I think really nut down, and we, I mean, we use in our assets section, it's a drop down menu, so you can always go in and have a look and see which ones apply to you. But um, where to start is really figure out who, who you want to get in front of exactly, how you want to grow, and then what your assets are, so what you can offer to a partnership in exchange for what you want in return. Lovely. Thank you for that. No worries. So the, um, one of the things that's also really important is that when there's two parties coming together, there are responsibilities within whatever the agreement is for that partnership. So if you're collaborating mm -hmm. to do something together, um, it's, it's really important to understand who's responsible for what to actually make it happen. So can you tell us a little bit more about that and perhaps remind us that um, it's important not to be shy when it comes to this <laughs> side of things because money may not be changing hands but that doesn't necessarily mean that there are obligations that each party has. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Well, money may not be changing hands but assets are changing hands and your asset is so, so valuable. Your assets are so valuable to you. So, for example, my Instagram following are my babies and I do not give that away lightly. You know, I don't just cross promote another brand for the sake of it. It's got to be offering value to my audience and all that kind of stuff. So it's it's almost bigger than money when you're exchanging your audience, if that makes sense. Yeah. So because your audience is your business. So responsibilities are hugely important and it's actually a lot of the time where um, partnerships, obviously not on Collabasaurus but elsewhere, can fall flat because, I mean, Collabasaurus ensures that before a connection is made, you actually know what that match um, is willing to exchange for and what they want as well and vice versa. So by the time you actually have a conversation, you each know what each other wants and you each know what each other has to exchange as well. So we kind of, with, with building Collabasaurus, we kind of broke down that gray area of responsibilities because we ensure that every brand on there is willing to offer something in return and all that kind of stuff. But there is that sort of, you know, stage afterwards where there is a little bit of a negotiation period and time passes and occasionally, you know, if agreements are made just verbally and um, they're forgotten <laughs> or something, that can happen too. So I think responsibilities need to be really, really clear and that comes down to not just saying things like, oh yeah, you know, I'll do a couple of social media posts between now and March or something. You have to know exactly when they're posting, what they're posting, you know, all that kind of stuff as well. The time, because you'll you'll want to track those and track and measure those um, results as well. So I actually have a Collabasaurus template, if you guys want one, that is literally just a table, but it's like roles and responsibilities and it acts almost like a bit of an informal contract and agreement that you each are very clear on what each party is doing. Mm -hmm. And then you can kind of look at it as well on paper and see if it's mutually beneficial. Make sure that, you know, it's quite equal in what you're exchanging and not one, one brand's not benefiting way more than the other. Sure. That would be great. We'll yeah. love to get that template, Jess. And, yeah, because we've also we, – well, I've definitely been in collaborations um, in the past where you've ended up doing most of the work um, <laughs> and, and or, it <laughs> yeah. or it hasn't been really clear and then you have this really awkward moment it was like oh but I thought you were going to do that and I was going to do this and yeah. you're really being yeah. brave to have converse, you know mm. brave conversations about what exactly is the commercial arrangement between the two of you and put it absolutely clearly in writing mm. um, with dates yeah, and really. deadlines and quantities and yeah. you know all that yes. kind of stuff is mm. really really important absolutely mm. So yeah, yeah let's have absolutely. to definitely. And I mean, it's just like, yeah, and it's just like being at school, you know, when you're in those group projects. I was always the one who ended up doing everything <laughs> as well. <laughs> oh. And I hated it. So I think, it, I think you know, it comes from that experience as well. Everything has to be fairly equal. And I mean, always though, because every collaboration is different, one brand might have a heaps of budget to spend but no time and the other brand has the time as the asset to actually implement the collaboration. So everything is very relative and you do have to have a conversations about that and work that out. But I think be confident in your asset and be confident in what 
you know you can offer as part of a collaboration and that can really help as well. Yeah, and be realistic. So, you know, where, where you're talking about that little mm. Melbourne bakery and that top shop one, mm. it's like don't just get don't get intimidated by working with a big brand either. Like, you know, still no. make sure that you value your your assets um yeah, equally. Yeah. You don't want to be the, you know, stuck with doing a an unrealistic amount of work um just for the opportunity oh, yeah. either. I mm. think that's really important. Mm. So Definitely. for those that weren't aware, you know, we run a, an e-course about content marketing <laughs> and social media. So I guess it would be um, very logical to probably spend a little bit more time now just talking about um, social media collaborations and if, Jess, you could share some, some of your tips on, on how to make those as successful as possible. Yeah, I mean, they, social media collaborations are really interesting and they're probably the sort of the the most engaged with at the moment, I guess, because it's such an important important platforms to be on for business now. Um, I think social media collaborations, I mean, Collabosaurus breaks it down into two types. So there's competitions and then there's cross promotions. So I'll talk about competitions because, I mean, that one is very easy to have get your head around I guess you see them all over Instagram and all that kind of stuff too but my point and my tip on competition collaborations on social media is really firstly have a goal in mind so know really what you want to realistically achieve out of a competition because I see a lot of businesses just give away products you know every week they're pushing products and giveaways and collaborations and then they sit back at the end of the year and go wow like that actually cost a lot of money to do and we didn't see much results. So I think with competitions, limit the amount of collaborators you have involved. So only collaborate with maybe one or two other businesses in a giveaway um, so that you get the best possible um, exposure with those audiences. Also be really clear as to um, the leverage, so who's posting when and how many times, have that all be quite equal. Um, and also we're going to go through a little bit later as well how to leverage a collaboration. Make sure it's not just carried out on social media. Market, social media is part of a broader marketing plan. So you need to make sure you know, you're know you feeding people through to all the fun stuff that's happening on social media through your emails or through PR or through you know your events, all that kind of stuff as well. You've got to make sure that you leverage it in as many ways as possible. So that's competitions. Limit how many you collaborate with to get the best possible results and exposure. And then the other one is cross promotion. So that's as easy as, um, I mean, I know on my um, Instagram on Collabosaurus, if there's something that I find that I really love, I'll often post about it anyway. And that's not a collaboration. That's just me going, oh my gosh, check this out, guys. I love it. So that's really just showing the love for a brand. And what you can actually do is structure that approach so that it's strategic anyway. So you know that it's almost like a one-for-one -one cross promotion with a complementary brand. So if you think about it, I mean, for me, Apple products or stationary brands, that kind of stuff, it would make sense for me to cross-promote on that anyway because I'm doing that already. It's just a way to kind of formalize it and make sure that you're getting some cool stuff out of that as well. So that's another way to use social media collaboration. Just, can I just sense. ask you a quick question on the point around competition? Yeah. At the moment, particularly on yeah. Instagram, there's the loop giveaway kind of idea yeah. where there's actually quite yeah. a few brands, you know, you know, yeah. up to 10, even sometimes more brands that collaborate on loop giveaways. Yeah. I've seen 25. Yeah, <laughs> crazy. Like I don't I like I I've heard mixed kind of um results about them. I don't have the attention span to go and actually click on twenty five mm. people to follow. Well, what? Yeah, yeah. What's your? Have you had much in, involvement with loop giveaways? Do you have, or have you got an opinion? Or? Yes. You know, I've done a fair bit of research into them actually because straight away when I saw them, come, I was going, no, you know, they're not worth it, and they're um, just a waste of time. I'm actually still on that mindset, but. I have heard of some businesses who've benefited from it, but it's very, very rare. Because if you think about it, just think about how you use Instagram and how you find other brands. If it's a loop giveaway, how many of those new followers are actually going to be genuinely interested and engaged with your business, you know? Because they are they just following it just to get in part of that giveaway and then they'll unfollow you straight away, or are they actually engaged with your brand? If if I think about the way I use Instagram, if another brand is just plugging one other brand, I'll often, you know how you go through comments and you end up, you know, it's like a you know, you get led down the rabbit hole and then all of a sudden you end <laughs> oh, up <yes. laughs> somewhere else on Pinterest or something. 
But um, yeah, so I, that's how I find new accounts through you know a business going check these guys out or we're doing a giveaway with one other brand and then I'll check that out. So it's actually it's more valuable exposure if you limit your partnerships. I mean that's my opinion anyway. That's not to say that loop give it up, giveaways do not work at all. They have worked in the past, but I know from experience that if you just have partnerships that are um, you know focused on maximum three brands all together, I promise you you'll get much better results. Yeah, so it's that old quality over quantity kind of idea, right? It's yeah. much better to, you know, yeah. gain, you know, 50 new followers who are really genuine, you know, genuinely complementary um, brands and followers mm -hmm. rather than 500 who aren't going to engage or, you know, just... Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And for those that aren't familiar with Loop giveaways, just Google Loop, L-O-O-P giveaway, and it'll give you a bit of background if you've not come across one on Instagram yet. I'm sure you will in the future. Yes, so, you'll be much more savvy to them. Yes, and moving on to point seven of our top ten. So you set up a collaboration and you obviously want the world to know about it. So what's the best way to actually leverage that and, and, and broadcast it and, and create that awareness? Yeah, look, I guess this also comes down to the type of collaboration you end up engaged in. But... I mean, you know, it's all well and good to do something really cool with another brand and execute an amazing partnership, but if no one knows about it, what's the, what's the point, I guess? Yeah. So my first, my first tip here is to really um, leverage your partner. So make sure that your partner is putting it out, broadcasting it out to their audience um, as much as you're broadcasting it out to yours too. Because I've seen in the past, again, not through Collabosaurus but through other partnerships where you know you get lured in by the excitement of maybe a big name, name brand and go oh wow they really want to collaborate with me that's so exciting you do all the pushing and then they just get a product and they don't do any like you know social media or exposure or anything for you yeah. and you just kind of finish at the end with a bit of a sigh and say okay well hardly anyone saw my product and I did so much promotion for them and how unfair. So I think the first one is to really leverage your partner. That's the biggest thing in a partnership. You're tapping into a community that already exists and vice versa to leverage that. Um, and then think about all the touch points you have with your community and with and them with theirs as well. So emails, social media, um, PR events, whether it's podcast webinars, all that kind of stuff as well. Think about or blog posts, think about all that kind of stuff and then how you can integrate your partnership and broadcast that out in all those different ways. Um, that, that's not spammy, you know, you've got to be wary that <laughs> you've got to offer your audience something of value. So that's the best collaborations come out of when two brands create something that's going to be valuable to both of their audiences. So then all of a sudden the promotion isn't spammy at all, it's not an ad, it's like a here's a product or a service or something with creating collaboration that's actually going to help you guys, which, you know, I'm going to reference our awesome webinar right now. Yeah. <laughs> an example and, of that. And, and the other thing is, yeah. that, um, is that often that there are limited edition or a limited time frame. So, you know, so it's not something that might necessarily be ongoing. So it's, you know, that's, that's yeah. an important thing to also um, to remember, I think, that um, sometimes the collaborations mm. are only temporary. So it's the opportunity to come in at a point in time um, that might not exist going forward. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> was that enough? Was that enough leverage talk? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Um, <laughs> okay, good. Point eight is, and Kylie kind of talked about it before, is actually determining your success metrics before you enter into the collaboration. But yeah. how do you actually go about measuring whether your collaboration was successful? And it may not always be about numbers, but if you could just give us yeah. maybe some tips on the different things that you can look at to, to decide, well, yeah, that was great, we'll do it again, or, hey, perhaps that wasn't yeah. the best way we could go about collaborating. Mm -hmm. Look, I think, um, and that comes back to the point um, we were talking about earlier about knowing your goal and focus. So if you really know um, and you're focused on one particular area of growth or thing that you want to um, you know, broadcast out into the world, if you know what that is, then all of that measuring around that um, becomes quite easy. So for example, if it's Instagram, make sure you take note of the Instagram following you have at the start mm -hmm. and then the Instagram following that you have at the end. Same with, you know, the email list growth or the event, you know, how much interaction do you have on social media or something. It depends on, 
it depends on your goal. Mm -hmm. um, the other way you know you can measure the success of a collaboration is really um, I usually sit down right at the end and while everything's really fresh in my mind and just jot down things I do differently next time. Mm. That's with everything, every marketing strategy I do. I jot down while it's still fresh. Often, I mean, sometimes with collaboration, just like a first date, just like in the dating world, um, sometimes personalities just clash and that's not your fault. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, and that's just something to take note of and you can spot red flags a little bit earlier next time perhaps. Mm. But yeah, write everything down, keep everything in writing, that's probably my biggest tip. The emails back and forth, they need to be always in writing. People sometimes do collaborations purely on phone calls and things mm. and there's no way to keep either of you guys accountable or anything like that um, or agreements you know, set in stone if nothing's in writing. But yeah, measure, measure the focus goals as you go um, and just take note of things that you do differently next time I guess. And I think aside from all the metrics, if it felt good and it was fun, sometimes yeah. that can be all yeah. that's required because it's lovely to, to actually work with somebody else, especially if you're a small business working on your own most of the time. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's Collaboration is fabulous. I mean, obviously, I love it. <laughs> I mean, I have to love it. Yeah, I, mean, I work in it every day. But yeah. I mean... <laughs> but to that point, you also don't know where they yeah, are. Yeah, but I mean, I'm... Pardon? I was just going to say, to that point, you don't always necessarily know where the collaboration is going to lead to. So, you know. No, no. You know, which is often, um, that's the whole possibility aspect of it as well, isn't it? It's sort of, you know, exploring the idea and, um, yeah, if it feels good, if it was, if it's with a brand that's complementary and it's with people that you, you know, are really excited by working with, sometimes that's, you know, and, and it's financially, it's sound, then sometimes mm. that's, you know, that's enough. Um yeah, absolutely. They're all the foundational stuff. If you've got all that, then the possibilities really are endless with collaboration. Yeah. Mm. So this is the fun bit because everyone loves a good example and sometimes <laughs> examples can help paint the picture for your business because you might be sitting there going, I really want to do this but I just can't picture how my business would enter into a collaboration. So when you can hear about what others have done, it can spark that creativity in your mind of what you can do so I know you've probably got a million mm -hmm. examples to draw on but <laughs> um, perhaps if we could you know a couple of examples that cut across the four different types of collaborations yeah yeah look I, I have sort of one for each because I know we don't have a bunch of time yeah, but, but the one that I've recently seen that was just fantastic was who gives a crap which yeah. is the um <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's just awesome. And um, Becky Orphan, who's a designer as well. So what they did was they created these um, toilet roll um, covers, I guess, that when you unwrapped it, the wrapping, it was all beautifully designed, but it actually folded into a chatterbox toy. You know those? Um, yeah. Is that what they're called, chatterbox? <laughs> uh, yeah, a paper, a paper so, chatterbox. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so awesome. So so design-wise, it was fantastic, um, and it it was visually stunning. Lots of social media stuff came from that, of course, because it was just so Instagrammable. But then a lot of PR came from that too, because it was so creative and awesome. If you think about it, you know, Beck's a designer, and she's very, very talented in a very crowded space. There's so many designers out there and stuff, but this is a way she's been able to find this incredible cut through with some quirky, awesome campaign that has seen such amazing results already and it's really only just begun. I would definitely check it out. Who Gives a Crap is fantastic and she's aligning herself with, you know, a social enterprise that's doing good for the world. So what a I great collaboration yeah. there. So that's, that's really important because I'm not sure that Beck necessarily needs, that Becky necessarily needs. <laughs> She's kind of pretty well known in design circles, but I think the fact that she was doing work yeah. that was aligning with her values mm. um, in yeah. terms of, you know, who gives a crap being a social enterprise that donates 50% of their property uh, um, profits to solving world sanitation problems. It was just, you know, the mm. right audience with the right mindset um, and it sold like hot, yeah. like it just, it's, I went to go and buy someone that was already sold yeah. out. So, so if anyone yeah, wants same. to know more about what we <laughs> we've popped a link on our Facebook of Kin page and our private Facebook group where you can read more about that collab. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and it's the same, there was benefit for who gives a crap as well. Of course, they're tapping into um, Beck's market and then also finding a way to get great cut through elsewhere, like like in the media and that yeah. kind of stuff as well. Yeah it, yeah, yeah, it created a lot of PR buzz in its mm. own right. Mm. I, know I Instagrammed it because I just thought it was brilliant and I love both of those, mm. products, you know, so, mm. yeah, it, it, it was self-perpetuating after a while. Yeah, it was such a perfect example and so mutually beneficial. Like you can see instantly the benefit for both sides. It was fabulous. Yeah. So, I mean, okay, so that was a product collaboration. That's an example of a product creation. The next one I've got is actually one that's a social media one. Um, that was just um, cross-promotional and it was a really cool campaign that um, Broadsheet did um, and Broadsheet, I think it was Broadsheet Sydney but I think they shared it across Broadsheet Melbourne and stuff as well. Every Sunday they'd get a cool little photographer to go around to their favourite breakfast spot or lunch spot or dinner spot um, and take photos that then they would share on social media. So each Sunday would be a new photographer that was showcased with their amazing photography showing, you know, that photographer's favourite local spots. And that got so much traction for those photographers because they're getting, these foodie photographers are getting in front of their absolute ideal audience oh. um, and getting, getting um, exposure for the venues that they're photographing for as well and in the media. And Broadsheet, in, in return, are getting incredible social media content as well, which is stunning visually. Um, and also building relationships with venues and photographers as well for down the track. So that was a really good one too. And the photo I posted on Collabosaurus as a, you know an example of a great collaboration, that has to date still been the, my highest engaging post on Instagram. And wow. that was probably about three months ago. I know, it was just such a beautiful image. So these are incredibly engaging. We should just call it Instagram Foodstagram and just be done with it, right? <laughs> it's the same with me. Like I posted this beautiful yeah. kind of chocolate cake for my business birthday and it got 600 likes. Like it's just by far and away. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. it was amazing. <laughs> it was yeah. food, food wins on Instagram, hand down. Yeah. Hands down. Hands down. I, know. I know it does, it does. And all the donuts, it's going crazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that brings me to my next example, which has to do with donuts, and that is an event collaboration. It's going to be an example of my own. So, um, Collabosaurus, we run business events as well, and what we try and do is um, we collaborate as much as possible on the event, but we limit our collaboration so that each you know collaborator gets exposure that's valuable. So, for this recent one that we did in Sydney. We collaborated with Woynelly Bakes, who does these incredible donuts. They're so amazing. And we also collaborated with the venue. So with Woynelly Bakes, for example, if we look at the ROI on that kind of thing, we got, instead of providing a goodie bag with a whole lot of just stuff in there, we wanted to provide each person with one thing that was very photogenic <laughs> and amazing, but also like this quirky, fun talking point as well. So we had these donuts individually boxed and co-branded with Calavasaurus and Wernelli, um, with you know both of our Instagram handles and stuff like that and the amount of social media traction we got from that was incredible. So that's an event collaboration because Wernelli were getting in front of a very particular target market. They were all female business owners in Sydney um, and that's quite specific and Wernelli were looking to um, you know build up their sort of corporate relationships too. So they got in front of some very um, influential people at that event and then also we collaborated with the venue because I mean and this is another sort of point I want to make about collaboration is sometimes you can't always do everything without any budget at all like I knew I wasn't going to have 90 people in a room eat and drink for free and host an event and have them staff the whole thing for free like that's ridiculous mm. so I you know we got a discounted price on the venue and the food and stuff in exchange for bringing people that are locals to that venue to experience it and experience the food. Also to include all of their branding on the um, event collateral to have everyone engage and check into the event and all that kind of stuff in the venue and take photos. And also we had our photographer take some venue shots before everyone arrived so that they had photographic assets. Mm -hmm. And we did some social media pushes as well. So there's so many different ways you can collaborate and different things you can exchange. But in the end, it was mutually beneficial. They ended up with photos, social media traction, 
a new audience, and we ended up with you know a venue on a, a heavy discount, which was incredible. And, um, and the same thing with you know the donuts. And you just don't know what you can get until you ask. Mm. And I think. Um, oh my god. You know, I think a lot of people just sort of take things on face value. But if you're up front and you say, look, I can't actually, you know, give you the full amount for what, you know, we would need, but this is what I can trade you in in return for either a discounted rate or or something like that. Like I'm, I'm one of the events that I ran this year um, – you know, we weren't able to actually pay the event higher fee, but we were able yep. to put that towards catering. And, you know, it was at a time of the day that they weren't actually going to use the space anyway. And, you know, I was yep. very upfront about what I could afford and what I couldn't afford and, you know, what, what else we could do to actually support them in doing that. And it, so it became a real, it did become a real collaboration where we were really honest about what we could and couldn't do and, you know, where our break points were. And it actually worked out really well, but it's having the courage to just have that conversation and and, um, you know, and I guess and know what your goals are and just say, you know, I can't run this without actually some help at this level and this is what I'd be looking to get out of it. Does, does that work for you? Mm. So always just ask. Oh, absolutely. You don't ask, you don't get. I'm absolutely. a big believer in it. Yeah, in every aspect of business, whether it's network. I mean, I'm so surprised to this day about how many people who have, I have just admired from afar, who I've gotten in contact with just off the cuff and asked to, you know, ask for their advice or catch up. And the amount of people I've been able to now build business relationships with and friendships with just astounds me. Because, But if I hadn't asked, I wouldn't have those contacts at all. Yeah. So, and the same thing goes for PR. You don't ask, you don't get. You've got to pitch out your press, like your media release and stuff, in order to get press in return. Otherwise, how are people going to know you're there? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Mm. All right. So that was um. So we've got the event, the social media, and then there's just one more, which is the referral marketing, and that's the um old school one. Like I said, a nutritionist and a PT, a marketer and a graphic designer that have complementary target markets that you can just refer each other clients. And we see a lot of that happening with our alumni that have done our workshops and our e-courses mm. are doing a lot of that within our private Facebook group where they'll make these alliances and go, oh, I've been looking for somebody in Sydney that I can refer people to for graphic design or yeah. I know someone that needs photographers and so they, you know, make that bond and, and, and have those kind of referral um, collaborations. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, referral marketing can pop up everywhere. That can happen through networking and all that kind of stuff too. Hmm. The way people would use Collabasaurus to establish a referral um, strategy is often businesses that can sell um, nationally or internationally and they want to establish referral partnerships in different major cities. So for example, I would you know, be looking to set up a referral partnership in New Zealand or in Perth or Adelaide, you know, a little bit more structured so I know that the complementary target market is there and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So my favourite is number 10 of our top 10 and it's that very poignant <laughs> question of so what's stopping you because <laughs> yeah. there are always answers <laughs> that, that people come up with and reasons as to why their business or them personally are not in a position to actually approach or decide to do a collaboration and I think you've got a very different answer um, for those people that think that. Yes, I do. I've got three major reasons as to why you'd be holding back. Number one is money. And so many people go, oh, I just don't have the funds to collaborate. And that is complete, I don't want to swear, but <laughs> <laughs> crap, I guess. <laughs> because if you, you don't need any money or any budget in order to collaborate because you can exchange different assets and that's all about thinking outside the box as well. I've got a really good article on what's stopping you, I guess, on Collabasaurus that I wrote myself, so of course I'm going to say it's really good. Um, so yeah, you don't need a big budget. You don't need money at all, actually, if you just think a little bit differently. And in um, the next one is... You can actually save money yeah. with a collaboration. Oh, my gosh. If you think about the Topshop collaboration I mentioned earlier... Um, the cost of marketing to that amount of people in her target market would have been thousands of dollars and really the collaboration in product mm. probably cost something like $200 so she didn't spend anything. Mm. She was using stuff she already had as her patisserie. Yep. So, and then Topshop, exactly the same. They saved so much money on catering. They would have saved about $5,000 on commercial catering by getting by involving her in a collaboration. So the ROI is huge. Yeah. Um, 
so yeah, money, you can actually save money or make money and you don't have to spend any money. So that's the big thing there. The second one is time. So traditionally sourcing a partnership can be very time consuming, um, particularly all of the research, reach out, negotiations, all that kind of stuff can be, yeah, quite can take quite a lot of time, especially if you don't really know where to start. So the answer that I have for that is to jump on Collabasaurus. It takes four minutes to do it and you can have a partnership within five minutes if you really want. Um, and then the third one is doubt. So doubt and sort of negativity and the fear of rejection is a big one that I hear a lot. People go, oh, well, you know, I've reached out to so many brands I want to collaborate with, but, you know, I always get a no back or no response and it's just disheartening and so I've abandoned it, which is horrible. <laughs> but, you know, I think the doubt element of it my first tip would just be, you know, be confident in your assets and what you can offer in a partnership. Um, but then also that it comes back down to the you don't ask, you don't get thing. You kind of, that's the sort of part of business and you just need to maybe change your approach with how you're reaching out to these potential partnerships. And the biggest tip there that I'd have for you if you're going to do it organically and outside of Collabosaurus is lead with your assets. Because every single person, no matter how giving and amazing they are, is always going to be thinking in the back of their head, what's in it for me? Always. Because it's a business deal. So yeah. if I get an email that's a super long essay about who you are and what you do and you know why you love what you do, then I'd be going, well, that's great, but I don't have time for this and I also don't see what's in it for me within the first three seconds, so I'll probably abandon it, you know even though I'm not a horrible person. <laughs> so I think if you, if you lead with your assets and go, hey, here's who I am and here's what we could potentially do together or here's what I can offer you, all of a sudden that becomes very attractive to that person you're reaching out to and you can establish a conversation. Even if you're not 100% clear on what you could do together because you've got to understand what your collaborator sort of wants out of that um, partnership as well. But just approach it from a space of I'm willing to help you. Yeah, and have some thought. Of, yeah, like go go with a bit of a solution, even if it's not the solution that ends up happening. Go, yeah, demonstrate yeah. that you that you understand what they're about and and what and yeah, and how you can fulfill a need for them as well. Um, yeah, always exactly. what's in it for them. Yeah, and I think the lovely yeah. thing about Collaborosaurus is for those people that rightly or wrongly. Um, label themselves that I'm not a salesperson, so I hate picking up the phone or I hate writing that email and sort of pitching myself, a lot of that on whatever <laughs> source is avoided because the match is made mm -hmm. for you and, and presented back to you. So then you just pick up the phone or email that person and go, hey, sounds great. So you've kind of avoided that if that's exactly. what you really feel. Exactly. You avoid the research and the reach out and a lot of the negotiation too. So by the time you actually establish a connection, that phone call is very easy because you've already told each other what you want and what you have. So mm. it just really becomes about the organisational side of things. Yeah. yeah. But even if some people are even paralysed to even get on there and do that, it's just it's remembering that, you know, often challenges do feel uncomfortable and if we do want to grow or if we do want to, you know, try new things, it, you are going to feel a little bit out of your comfort zone and, um, you know, because you can't be comfortable and courageous at the same time. So, you know, choosing courage to actually do <laughs> something and, um, you know, and to do something and, fe and feel, feel the fear and do it anyway. Like don't, mm -hmm. don't be paralysed by it just give it a go and you can always you can always back out or say no later but you're never going to know unless you ask and unless you put yourself out there and um and you know have some courage to actually back yourself on what you do um is what we're all about so Absolutely. Um, I mean Collabasaurus is anonymous as well so you've got nothing to lose no one will actually know you're on there until you've made a connection so <laughs> you can always suss out what kind of matches you return without revealing who you are yeah, I, I mean, I, I reached out to um, to the head of um, a bank here in Melbourne. Um, I actually didn't, I didn't do it through Collabosaurus. I actually did it direct on LinkedIn. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I but I sent them an email and just straight up said, you know, this this is why I think it would be great for us to work together on this particular project that I was working on. I knew very clearly who I wanted to work with and why. Um, but it was just having the courage mm -hmm. to kind of just email somebody out of the blue and just say, I really love what you're doing. This is what I'm doing. This is how it could be a great match. Um, and it did. It resulted in in um in a very you know very small collaboration. But you know, in my wildest dreams, the idea of just emailing the head of marketing for a bank. 
like, you know, it was just like, well, just get over yourself. The worst that she could do is ignore your email, but, you know, just get and do it. And you never know where you go until you actually ask. So, yeah. So, yes. Well, thank you for yeah. taking the, um, the, you know, the, 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 the uncomfortable bit out of doing that <laughs> in Collaborosaurus as well. <laughs> That's all right. So we're going to open up to questions now. We've got a few coming in. Um, so I'll read out the first one for you, Jess. And if, if anyone else on the um, call, make sure you type them in so we can cover them. Hi, Olga. <laughs> I hope your product is nearly at market. I want one very soon. <laughs> <laughs> so Olga has um, said that what if you're a startup and, um, you know, what if your brand doesn't have that big database or you've got no database and it's a big hurdle for startups, what what are some ideas that you could put forward um, to somebody to have a collaboration? <laughs> well, that's hard. That's hard without knowing what business you have actually. But I think, you know, that comes back to the point before is that you don't need money or you don't need a huge database to, to collaborate. You just have to know what you want to grow. So if that database is the thing you want to grow, um, think about the other assets you have to offer. So if it's a product-based business, perhaps you have product to offer as part of a collaboration or, um, you know, even a small, so, I mean, and this is the thing as well with social media, even a small social media following is still valuable. I've collaborated with people who have, you know, followings that are around the 200 mark and gotten better results than collaborating with people who have followings around the 3,000 mark. So it really depends on how engaged the communities are. Um, yeah. And then also think about your skill set as well. So, um, yeah, and that really comes down to what you do, whether it's design or photography or maybe your network, that kind of stuff, or your, maybe you have a venue space you can use as well as part of a collaboration. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know what Olga's product is and it's really unique. Yeah. And so I Ooh. think even though um, she doesn't have a big database, I think the fact that the uniqueness of her product um, and it's fresh um, is actually valuable in its own way. So, you know, mm. I, I, and, one, and a, another example I have is, um, you know, in the retail space, there's a lot of um, commoditization of products in the retail space and a lot of retailers stocking the same stuff or competing against suppliers who are now selling direct. So it's actually those mm -hmm. small, unique, individual brands that are hard to find that then become valuable. You know, it's it's yeah. so, you know, it's the fact that you are actually fresh and new and you haven't been seen everywhere before that actually is a strength in many ways. Oh, absolutely. Because that yeah. because that whoever you're going to collaborate with um is actually then has something new to talk about. It hasn't actually been seen all over the place. So it, it actually does have a bit of cut through because of that. So that's the other yeah, definitely. In working with startups, I see a lot of startups who think, I don't want to talk about what I'm doing until I'm launched or until I'm out there. And so they sit on it until they feel like they've got everything in place and, you know, all their ducks lined up in a row. But actually it's it's planting some of those things before you even go live so that when you go live you actually have um, an audience to talk to. So, you know. Definitely. Yeah, so I think the whole startup thing is don't let that hold you back. You know, if you're in a position to yeah. be able to put something out there, you know, the fact that you're new and up and coming, it can actually work to your favour for a lot of, you know, for a lot of collaborations. Definitely. I have seen it become a bit of a stigma, though. I get that question so much. People go, oh, well, I'm a startup, so I can't offer anything. No. <laughs> well, this, the next question we've got, Jess, is going to touch on probably another barrier that people see is, and we have quite a few of our kin that are from regional areas, and I'm one as well. Um, yeah. So Amber said, I live in a small town um, away from major cities, but I want to eventually push my talents in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, so mm -hmm. what could she offer in a collaboration? What's the business? What type of? Um, Amber, what do you do? I've tell asked us. Amber to tell us. If you could just type that in, Amber. Tell us what you do, Amber. But what I, I mean, by the sounds of it, like, I mean, I'd look to collaborate, like set up referral partners and um, maybe events, sort of ones that are location specific so it gets you an in or exposure into particular areas that you do want to gain access to, so things like Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane, if that's where you want to go, then you can seek collaborations based on sort of location and target market. So you know who you want to get from front of and your goal is to gain access and exposure within a particular location sort of market. 
market. You can use Collabasaurus to do it that way. You can do a bunch of research around complementary businesses and companies that are set up in those areas that can give you a sort of exposure with those audiences. So Amber's come back saying it's a cupcake business and she specialises in miniature oh. cupcake toppers. In the toppers. Oh, my God. That is so cool. I love that. Yeah. I think events would be huge for you, events and social media, because it's such a visual kind of product and you can get a lot of exposure very quickly by offering, you know, something that's so stunning and a physical thing that people enjoy. <laughs> anyway, so, I mean, I think about events. If you're doing events with a particular, like, I guess the Collabasaurus events would be quite a sort of good example of the types of events you could get in front of where it's, you know, your target market all in a room all at once and they're all social media posting every yeah. five seconds anyway. So it'd be and they're all in Sydney. So that'll be, you know, a great type that you could pick for events, I would say, events and social media. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so we have another one from one of our um, very special kin, Jody English. Um, so Jody actually has a beautiful stationery business as well as being a graphic designer herself. Um, so her question is, if it's a new product collaboration where the cost is part of creating the new product, do you find the best way is to just split the costs or split the profits? What's the best way to go with that? Uh, that's a really good question and I think that is a big hurdle I think for a lot of product collaborators because always there's a little bit of skew where one brand has a little bit more sort of asset wise to offer than the other so whether it's you know if we think about the things that go into creating a product as in collaboration there's the creation and manufacture and the design and then there's also the promotion of it as well so often what I've seen in these partnerships is that one brand will offer most of the manufacture and design and the other one will offer most of the cut through in terms of promotion, um, in which case that's a fairly even split and you can split it down the middle. But if you are seeing that, you know, um, sort of one brand in that partnership is taking on a little bit like maybe most of the manufacture and then the promotion as well, then I would definitely negotiate a little bit more of a sort of um, a profit split that can reflect those kind of, that kind of input, if that makes sense. Because your time is money as well and that's very, very valuable. Yeah, so that comes back to that kind of be really yeah, frank and upfront and, um, you know, and just yeah. put your expectations. Know what you want to get out of it. Yeah, that's right. And what you're prepared to invest into it, you know, to get that in return. Mm, yeah. Definitely. Um, we have another question from Lisa Scott. Um, Lisa lives in regional Queensland and finds that many local businesses are reluctant to collaborate as they see collaborating with their competitors. Do you have any advice to overcome that reticence? Oh, that's such a shame. I think um, if the if your product doesn't like if you can sell it online and um, get it out there a little bit more um, into other areas, there is just so much opportunity for collaboration there. But when it comes to that kind of mindset where it's really hard to convince you know um, people to collaborate with you, that's really tricky. But Again, I'd probably frame the way that you approach that as to really listen, like here's what I can do for you, list the assets and just be like, why aren't we having a conversation? The whole competition or competing mindset is very old school and it's almost impossible to get ahead now if you do think that way, um, particularly if you want to expand as like, you know, a sort of bigger business. It is tricky in, in a small town though, like that's hard. If, you're, if your business is very reliant on that local market and then you're not able to collaborate, that's really tr tricky. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I'd explore the possibilities outside, outside of your immediate area if you can. Yeah, I'm with you. You don't really want to have to drag someone to the table if they don't no. really want to be there because it's just not going to work. I mean, we've, we've definitely had situations where it's just felt, you know, when we got into it, it's just like, oh, you know what, this isn't what we thought it was going to be and it just doesn't feel right anymore. Um, mm. So, yeah. Um, so, Lisa. And don't be afraid to ditch it either. Like I've seen, mm. you know, and I've personally experienced as well, you get halfway through a collaboration and you just go, this is not what we agreed and this is becoming just seriously exhausting and it's just not working. It's too much of an energy drain and um, it's just not worth it doesn't become worth it anymore if it completely changes 
um, direction and it's just not working anymore, don't be afraid to nip that in the bud and just like let that go and, and just be really upfront and open about why um, and you know this time around this is not going to work and just learn from that and move on I would say. That's right. That it, well what doesn't work is great information you know like if it's mm. not working mm. that's great information to get you closer to what will work. Yeah. So yes absolutely. Yeah yeah. All right. Does anybody else have any other questions? We, um, we're we pretty much, we've just gone over time. So if no one else has any questions. Um, you can always email me if you want. Yeah, so all of, um, <laughs> all of Jess's contact details are here except your email address. I didn't put on there. Um, <laughs> Is it Jess at Calabasaurus.com? Okay. Uh, the best ones for questions and stuff would be info at Calabasaurus.com. Beautiful. And then I can help you out there. But, I mean, what we're going to do as well with you guys who have joined us on the call live. Um